Okay, yeah, good. Thank you. That was um, beautiful and challenging. And I will read something also as a start to explain these images, but also to explain a bit about, um, uh, well, uh, we say it's, it's sort of prologue, first of all, about, uh, about the past and the present, and also about modernity and post-modernity, as it impinges on my own life and experience. And uh, I was trained as an architect in the AA school in London in the, in the 50s, 1950s and 1955. And after that, I went to the British Army. And after that, I, I went to Israel for a year. And I came back and I started to work in, first in a local authority office, but then for a practice that bore the name of Douglas Stephen and Partner. And I, uh, this is um, images of, a, of an apartment building that I, I designed. Uh, yeah, basically, I designed everything in this building and detailed it. and it was. Amazingly enough, got to be built, actually a uh, speculative block. And I suppose it could be said it was, um, it has a certain brutalist aspect to it, you know. And, um, um, and had these uh, very ingenious kind of apartments and had this, um, yes, this kind of spatially uh, integrated garage that was integrated with the structure. And I, I, I thought I would just show that um, image because, um, maybe I should go back to there, because I, I, wanted, I, I wanted to use it in a way to explain that I was formed in the first half of the 50s as um, a modern architect, you know, with with the idea that there was something called the modern project, and that um, that this could be achieved, you know, and um, actually, I, I I came to the U.S. in uh, <coughs> in 1965 and encountered for the first time in New York the furor of mid 20th century modernization as opposed to the modern project, which had the effect of politicizing me. In a way, um, uh, it pushed me towards the left of the political spectrum, which is where I still find myself. At the same time, it also made me realize that the vastly wasteful, predominantly automotive, suburbanized land settlement pattern of the United States, uh, one thinks of Wendell Berry's uh, concept of the of it as a kind of unsettlement, the unsettlement of America, as a, as a universal consumerist precept that would never be capable of realizing the modern project, uh, to coin the phrase of the German philosopher Habermas in his book uh, Towards a Rational Society, he coined the term unfinished modern project. And this is by the way of saying that, well, why didn't I read it more directly? In a word, however, unconsciously, I was compelled to recognize by virtue of the American um, modernization as a capitalist process that we were living in a postmodern moment in which the issue of unifying a modern mode of architectural practice and way of life did not exist as opposed to the expansionist era of the post-Civil War America, which, driven by the vast wealth opened up by the transcontinental rail system, sought to equal and even to transcend the civilized achievements of the European continent. That is to say, to create overnight, as it were, in the 25 years that transpired uh, before the First World War, Railway stations, barracks, to military academies, universities, libraries, museums, state capitals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as the essential kind of uh, institutions of a modern society, and the fact that they were to achieve this, in fact, 
with, with you know, uh, one language, one code, the, the language of classicism, of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. I mean, that was a, a kind of modern project, I think. Uh, it perhaps was not, strictly speaking, a liberative modern project. And, and certainly not the liberative modern project of the interwar avant-garde in Europe, you know, between the end of the First World War and the beginning of the Second. And uh, I suppose, of course, it brings me back to this point in which in the, in the 50s, beginning five years after the end of the Second World War, it, it, one still had the idea that it would be possible to realize a kind of liberative modern project which would be uh, very di different from the, the representation of the, of the classical representation of the American um, triumph, if you like, of the period between, um, yeah, I think we can say 1890 and maybe, uh, yes, I suppose 1930, something like that. You can think of Rockefeller Center as being a kind of modern version of that, um, that very uh, assured code of architecture. And, and I suppose, you know, um, in the 50s, one thought that one could um, also realize a kind of coherent uh, code of modernity, which not only in terms of architecture, but in terms of social institutions and that they could, um, um, yes, it could, they, well, it could be realized. And I think when I came to the States, I realized that, you know, that that is not possible, really, that that moment is not, uh, is not achievable, that one is already in a postmodern moment. This is before, um, well, before the use of the term postmodern, which really, of course, only starts probably well, I think there's a famous book by Jean-Francois Lyotard, uh, Postmodern Condition, it's 1979, and one year later in Venice there is this, uh, Paolo Portuguese organizes this, uh, this exhibition with the title The Presence of the Past, the End of Prohibition. I mean, this is, this is the postmodern moment which opens up to a kind of plurality of, of language games, in effect. You know, there isn't and then a kind of... Um, coherent, uh, universally understood code, as was the case in, the, in what I just referred to, which is this period of the creation of a kind of American modernity under the sign of the École de Beaux-Arts. And um, so uh, I, I felt that, um, that, it, that that in a sense one had to try to reconstruct what was this, um, yeah. this what, what was modern architecture? You know, what, what was the legacy of modern architecture? And I, I thought that one way to go about this was to actually compare um, two buildings. In this case, there are two buildings, uh, not built, but projects for the League of Nations uh, competition of, of 1927. On the left, of course, the famous project of Le Corbusier, and on the right, the uh, equally by now well-known project by Hannes Meyer and Hans Wittwer. And uh, so that the first time I started to think that one might gain something out of comparing two buildings that were for the same program, was on this occasion. I kind of, in a sense, sort of stumbled into it. And in 1968, I wrote a text bearing the title Humanist versus Utilitarian Ideal, with, of course, reference humanists to the League of Nations building, the entry of Le Corbusier, and the, the term uh, utilitarian reserved for the Hannes Meyer Hans Bilfer project. And, so I thought I would begin where I began in 68 um, with these two comparisons. Well, this was anyway published in 68. And the, 
Well, m m many things can be said about this. I mean, perhaps the first thing to be said is the kind of fetish, fetish, fetishization of production in the case of the Han Han Hannes Meyer Hans, Hans Fitzgerald project. The fact that it's an entirely modular building is the same module used throughout. And uh, it's very much like the Crystal Palace, in fact. Uh, uh, and, and it's also extremely empirical. I mean, if you look at the, I realize I don't have a pointer, but if you look at the, the um, you know, it's divided. It's important to notice that it's rather obvious, but it's divided into two parts for the same competition, that is to say between the assembly building and the secretariat block, as, of course, is the United Nations uh, building in New York. And, uh, but when one looks, for example, at the Secretariat block in the case of the um, scheme by Hans Meyer, Hans Dittler, you realize that one could add one more bay or take away a bay from the lower part of the building. It would make no difference. It's still essentially the same building. And the same could be applied to the perimeter uh, structure around the central as assembly hall. This is not true in the case of this building where you know the thing is symmetrically organized in fact although it's very much categorically a modern building it is also at the same time you know it has a kind of classical underpinning not to say palladian underpinning in terms of the structure of the main assembly building but also in terms of the structure of the um, secretariat block and uh, in this discussion about these two works, this comparison between these two works, which I, I published in 68, and which you can, if, if you're at all interested in it, can, you can read at some length in um, this collection of essays bearing the title Labor Work and Architecture. You know, one, could, one can pick up on um, all sorts of different aspects where different values are built into the project from the beginning. So for example, Meyer, who thinks that you know, the product of the human species is of the utmost importance and that nature is of no particular consequence, and makes a project which is, which is a kind of a, yes, it's a sort of, uh, uh, well, they're both axonometrics, of course, but in this case, there is no, no indication about the site at all. There are other drawings, admittedly, that are published at the time that do give some indication of where the building is, but you can see in the image on the left that the question of the integration of the building with the natural landscape is of primary importance to the Le Corbusier uh, solution. Or, you know, it's very fascinating that in fact the, the competition brief asked for uh, 100 automobiles to be parked on the site and Le Corbusier, uh, the actual solution that he came up with is two parking places short, 98, you know. Whereas the Hannes Meyer thing, he provides for 500 automobiles, both underneath the building but also in a separate parking garage. And the whole kind of site is in, in, inundated with automobile movement. In that sense, of course, it's you know, categorically pro-automotive. It's before really, that's what the extraordinary thing, if you think of 27, it's well before the mass ownership of the automobile. And, and, um, and the whole, um, System of the way you get into the building is also determined about you know how you where you park your car etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas the, in the Le Corbusier case it's much more hierarchic, the cars are chauffeur driven, you know. So and and there is all a, a whole value thing built into this. I mean it, it has to do with the fact that uh, Hannes Meyer is a Marxist. He, you know, he's looking for an egalitarian society where people drive themselves. Etc. Etc. And and this um, this same kind of uh, um, yes functionalist, if you like, or productive objectivity, um, you know, permeates the entire building and also the circulation in the building. The the uh, elevator shafts which support this red sky sign, for example, are glass elevators that pass up. And the building is very much considered as a machine, you know, with escalators, elevators. In fact. There's a kind of a overkill of circulation in the building, whereas the uh, look well, look obviously also of course has elevators and staircases, but they're much more um, uh, modulated in their uh, in their 
Well, they, you know, he uses staircases, of course, uh, in the in the traditional sense. So, what uh, I mean, I don't want to belabor it. Uh, yes, to, to to take it too far, but I I think what's clear is that um, different values are built into these two buildings, and you can actually I, uh, identify how these values are present in the building as you compare, in this particular case, one one to the other. These are the two auditoria, and the fact is that this egg-shaped auditoria, which is inside the Hannes Meyer, is, um, is not actually the ideal acoustic shape. And, and although there are kind of scientific diagrams pointing out the way in which the, the, um, the acoustics are supposed to work, but the thing that fascinates me is that if you look at the, the image on the top right, you see that the structure of this egg uh, produces these diagonal supports. And those diagonal supports, it's particularly evident in the cross section on the right, you know, are totally uh, non-coherent with the field of columns on the standard module that surround the egg. Whereas the Le Corbusier case, which is I know a bit hard to read, but you can see the top left there. There are these longitudinal trust 70 meter spans with these transverse uh, girders going into them. So that the, the architect that is the more humanist and hierarchical is also the architect that is able to devise a more rational solution paradoxically. And here you have this strange uh, um, Conjunction, if you like, between um, well, but, well, between uh, um, you know the paradox that the that the the functionalist, objective, productive, leftist architect would would um, not and refusing all hierarchy, you know, the same module all the time, would not be able to arrive at a more rational solution for the structure of the auditorium, whereas look obviously, and this, and there are many details, and I'm not going to go further with this. If you, if you, you look at the way, for example, um, Maya provides no way whatsoever for cleaning the glass of the building, but look obviously, uh, you know, you can, you can see at so many different levels that the, that the more hierarchical architect, the architect that you could say is utopian socialist as opposed to Marxist, um, actually, uh, ultimately pr produces, hypothetically, because of course neither building was built, uh, the more rational solution. But this, um, yes, well, why is this a pertinence to the main body of what I want to try to treat with this evening, which is, it, it's a point of beginning of, of comparing two buildings uh, um, um, uh, answering to the same program and trying to point out through analysis what is similar and what is different and what is the importance of the similarities and the differences. You know. it, 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 um, I think you know, what, what confronts an architect in the, in the postmodern condition is what difference does it make really, whether it's done this way or that way? You know, what fundamental difference does it make? I mean, apart from, I don't know, values to do with economy or to um, or circulation. I mean, a certain kind of objective criteria that can be applied, you could say, to almost any building. But when it comes to the form of the building or the detail of the building, the question of understanding what differences it makes, why should one do it this way rather than that way? What is the, what is the, what is the rationale behind the decision-making process I mean, that, I think, is something that still haunts um, architectural schools and the creation of architecture. You know, it, what I'm trying to get at here is that under classicism, under the Echo de Beaux-Arts, this had, there was a system for all of this, you know. It was a code that could be followed and executed, you know, with a certain kind of um, assurance. But, once the avant-garde had arrived, you know, and, and a kind of the, the, the 
you know, the idea of new techniques and new ways of thinking and new ways of living and so on and so forth. Um, then, you know, the, another, another condition was posited, but, but with not such a clear, no, the clear, there were not any more the same kind of rules as there had previously been under classical, in, in classical culture. And, and you can say, well, that's all for the good, you know, of course, we've always thought it's for the good. But it, it creates a kind of, uh, it does create a kind of problem of exactly how should one teach architecture, how should one criticize architecture, how should one interpret architecture. All of these things are not so uh, self-evident. So in the mid-60s, when I started to teach at Princeton, I was asked to um, give a course with the title Values, Concepts, and Methods. So even if the title of that course already touches on the dilemma, I think, you know. And, well, of course, I was naive enough to accept the task of giving this course. No one told me how to give it. And, and so I, you know, I tried to get kids to read, uh, you know, I don't know what, certain kind of improving theoretical texts. But, um, all right, they, they, they were fine, but they, uh, after a certain while, well, I ran out of the textual material in any case, and then I asked students to analyze buildings then I ask students to analyze single buildings. And you can analyze one building up to a certain point, but then it is what it is. It's kind of a tautology. And then, I, then I thought, if you analyze two buildings, this is, goes me, brings me back to analyzing these two entries for the League of Nations competition. If you analyze two buildings for the same program, perhaps then there is this kind of sameness and differences between the two buildings, which allow one to anyway uh, um, come closer to the idea of the implicit or explicit values that are already built into the building, you know, in terms of the way it's organized, in terms of its structure, in terms of its expression or suppression of structure, in terms of its spatial hierarchy, in terms of the way it is detailed, and so on. And um, so this led me to give this course, which for many years was entitled The Comparative Critical Analysis of Built Form. I gave it in Princeton. I also gave it for a brief while in the Royal College of Art in London. And I gave it for a very long time, on and off, in Columbia. And um, Ashley Simone, who is with me here and who is involved with this in school, in any case, and online learning, has been with somehow rather mixed up with this endeavor of mine for quite a while, I mean, for a decade, I think. And, I, and when I say endeavor, I'm referring to two things, not only to the course itself, where she was an assistant, uh, and I don't give it anymore, but also to making a record of this course. So I had this funny idea to make a record of the course, and uh, with uh, Ashley's help, and I think without Ashley, it, it would never exist, uh, it will be published as a book by Lars Muller in Zurich under a slightly misleading title called uh, Genealogy of Modern Architecture, but uh, it is the, the same, I think it's a, it's a good title from a, a selling point of view, but uh, it is the same, it's a record of this course on the comparative critical analysis of built form. And, um, and I, sh I think I need to say something about what was the, was the aims of this course, because, uh, um, you know, it, it was an attempt to, uh, well, above all, it was an attempt to bridge the gap between academic teaching of history and theory and studio. So that was one uh, strong aspect behind the course, was to somehow show how the tradition of the new, of the modern, you know, as opposed to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, you know, had its own, its own kind of... Uh, coherent uh, uh, development, by, by example, of course, by, by looking and comparing certain buildings. That was one. Uh, and therefore also to heighten students, uh, it's a kind of consciousness, consciousness raising operation to heighten students' awareness of uh, what difference does it make? What, if you, what, what is the, what are the, what is actually going on if you compare two buildings that are, uh, two canonical buildings that are answering the same program. 
And then also, of course, to encourage a kind of critical attitude to, to sensitize students to, yes, to the differences and similarities in the way in which works are developed. So, um, uh, over a, a long period of time and with a good deal of repetition, because uh, that's, that's something else that one begins to realize. If you, in playing this game, you realize that unless the two buildings that you're comparing are developed to the same sophisticated level and, and kind of cultural density, there's no point in comparing them, you know, didactically speaking. You can't get anything out of the comparison unless the comparison has a certain density to it. You know. So that's, uh, so the, the whole thing is altogether overdetermined. I mean, but I think, or I have the illusion, perhaps total illusion, that the students who, after all, self-selected to some extent, and this was a, an elective and not a required course, you know, uh, got a lot of out, out of this game of, of, uh, of my sort of predetermining what buildings they were going to compare and under what categories, what categories would they look at in making the comparisons. And um, so I, I, I think, uh, uh, what I'm going to do this evening is to show you three comparisons, but before I get there, I think I have to say something about the categories under which they were compared. And um, well, you know, when if you just go back for a moment to these um, two. Um, entries for the League of Nations that I mean what's uh, it's fascinating that if you if you ask you know well and where what is the similar and different between these two works well it's fascinating of course that the that the um, look up museum building was was supposed to have been faced in granite in polished granite you know coarse stonework and this building was supposed to be faced in asbestos cement, you know. And, and indeed, that's also interesting that Meyer would talk about the entry as our building for the League of Nations. And Le Corbusier would talk about the Palais de Nation, you know. It, the, I mean, the title of the competition was Société de Nation. But the fact that one uses the term building, our building for the League of Nations, and the other one, uses the term palais, which of course already um, implies this um, link to classicism. And uh, yeah, so and then then you know the well the fact that one building is horizontal, you know, and is lies into the surface of the lake, apart from what happens in plan, and uh, and the mountains behind it, and the other one is vertical, you know. Um, and of course, as I already said, there's difference in attitude towards landscape, uh, and um, the machinism of one to, to versus the mod mod modernized machinist aspect of the other, and so on. And um, so, uh, I, I I I developed, you know, in the light of that, uh, lo looking at the buildings from certain points of view, like for example, the relationship of the type, the a a priori type of the building in relation to the context, context being topography, climate, vegetation, etc., etc. And then um, the breakdown, the hierarchical organization of the space within the building into public space, semi-public space, private space, service space. Or the organization of, the, uh, uh, or the, the movement of the human subject through the space, this idea of root goal, Another category, and and you know the, from the point of entry to the point of kind of ultimate arrival, you know, within the body of the building, or fourth point was structure in relation to membrane, and that brings up you know this question of expression of structure or repression of structure in the two buildings, and then finally the fifth point, which was not so sort of di dyadically organized, was the question of the connotations of the details, uh, or the, well, details and materials. Because based on the idea that 
that the, there is, in fact, a continuing tradition, you know, also in the new, tradition of the new, and that nothing comes from nothing, and certain materials have associations, or certain details have associations which are, are present in values in the work, depending on the way in which the work is detailed. Um, I mean, there, there are obvious things like, well, I mentioned already the question of the opposition between asbestos cement in one case, the kind of hair shirt for a, a hard-nosed, objective, productive building, Hans Meyer, Hans Bitver entry for the competition, versus gr polished granite in the other with all the associations that polished granite implies. Or, you know, if you, you are talking about Asian culture, for example, China, Japan, etc., where wood is a perhaps more honorific material than stone, then the value gets, of course, uh, changed depending on the context. And um, so, I, I, this course was always um, begun with, uh, where am I going? Wrong direction. Um, with these two buildings, because, um, you know, because they represent, well, their the respective dates is Maison Cook is 26 and the Riefel Schroeder House is 24. And they, they represent uh, uh, two ca kind of canonical modern works, one of which is associated with Le Corbusier's famous Five Points of a New Architecture, and the other one is associated with Van Dersburg's 16, 16 Points of a Plastic Architecture. So they, in this case, they're, they're avant-gardist works, so-called avant-gardist works, that are, that are kind of modern projects that envisage a new architecture entirely, uh, but a new architecture that has a very different character. And um, one of which is based on reinforced concrete frame construction, which is, of course, the Maison Cook, um, and, and on cantilevered, uh, in fact, this facade you're looking at, of course, is in cantilevered in front of the column system. And, and, uh, and the other one, you, you don't quite know what it's made of, as a matter of fact. It is, it is of course, a, a stud frame building, actually, that is then boarded and plastered on the exterior. And, uh, and of course, uh, and colored, not, not the actual primary surfaces, but, of course, the famous neoplastic uh, six, you could say six or three, uh, chromatic uh, pieces, you know, the red, yellow, and blue, and the um, gray, white, and black. Uh, yes, m more kind of categoric, didactic uh, um, color elements than in the case of the Maison Cook. And, and built for di very different clients, one might notice, but perhaps one can get to that. I, I don't actually, I, I touch on the clients in passing, like for example, the um, now the Maison Cook is on the left and the Riedfeld Schroeder House is on the right. And these are pages from the book, in fact, which are disturbingly still somewhat washed out. But um, what you see is that the Maison Cook is, of course, a, a building inside, inside a terrace. It only has two facades, front and back. We mostly uh, you mostly see in all the published material the, the front of the building. And, and the, already you see very prominently this single column in the middle, which is the, already uh, an example of the famous piloti, which is one of the five points of the new architecture. And um, you see that the trajectory of the automobile goes straight in and the trajectory of the human subject slightly wanders in in a somewhat drunken fashion. And in the, in the case of the Riefel Schroeder House, it's a, it's a building on the end of a terrace, an existing brick terrace, which is a sort of pinwheeling composition. It's not, the one is frontalized, the Maison Cook, the one uh, uh, at the end of the terrace is a pinwheeling composition. And in fact, ideally, it should be a freestanding pinwheeling object. And in fact, in the 1923 exhibition in the Gallery Lyons Rosenberg in Paris, 
Van Dersberg and Corr van Eesten together make a series of models of such three-dimensional pinwheeling projects. And um, here, for example, uh, you can see the, these are analyses of the uh, ground floor on the left and the upper floor on the right of the two-story Rietveld Schroeder house. And then in the right-hand side, you have the transformed upper floor and the section through the building. And they are coded yellow for private, blue for public, and gray for service. And you see the, the, um, the red line shows the basic trajectory through the house. And, uh, and the, the arrowheads are the points of arrival generically in each case. And, and uh, you can see on the right, you know, that the red line uh, actually brings you up the staircase in a pinwheeling formation that um, uh, corresponds to the pinwheeling space arrangement of the building with these balconies flying out of the, of the main cubic uh, form of the building, you know, uh, in this kind of spiraling fashion. And um, I mean, the, the most, um, well, the most, one of the most radical things about the building is that um, um, the, yes, if you, if you compare this image on the right to the image on the left, this is the famous transformable plan in which the sliding folding screens can be withdrawn from subdividing the upper part into a small, uh, uh, sort of uh, kitchen living room there on the, in the bottom right hand corner and the private sleeping spaces for herself and her two, two children. This is for uh, Madame Trost, uh, uh, Schroeder Schrader and her two kids. Although very quickly we felt uh, sort of insinuated himself into this family group and it became a, the architect uh, had sort of joined forces with the client. and. Um, but you, you can see in the transformable plan, the, the, public, the, 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 the whole of the upper floor becomes public space because the withdrawal of these um, component parts, including what is really kind of ingenious, but also by our standards, probably somewhat preposterous, that the bathroom, which is the service element and the WC by the side of it, you know, opens up in the case of all the, all the Partitions are in place and closes up into a kind of silent unit, you know, once you open up the, the first floor to public space. Oh, that's great, yes. Didn't realize what I was missing. Yes, okay. Does it read? Yes, oh, it does. Okay, so that's the bathroom I was referring to. Right. And you, is it going to reach there? Some reason it's not. Oh, it is, sort of. There, so it's closed in that position. And um, as opposed to the maison cook, that yeah, where it, there's nothing transformable going on. This is the ground floor. The garage enters here. I, the, we code the main stair system as, as public. It rises up here and feeds these private spaces. This is the boudoir and then the uh, second bedroom, third bedroom, and these are, this is the, um, uh, yes, it's a kind of bathroom. And then here is the kitchen, which in this case should all be gray and isn't, which is a, mistake, but because that is clearly a service element. Sorry, th this, is, uh, no, this is the bathroom element, service element in the kitchen is here on the floor above. So you pass up through, <coughs> you pass up through this sleeping floor uh, to this upper sort of two-story space, which, which is as a single, uh, ceiling height here over the dining and then goes to a double height volume here with a staircase rising here 
to feed this library mezzanine and then out to this terrace. And uh, you, you, in this building there is a, uh, well, first of all, I said it already it's frontalized, but there is also an axial, uh, there, well, it's a, it's a synthesis, in fact, of two types. Well, well, there is reference to classical type in, in terms of the fact that the axis uh, runs through, you see this is a center line, runs here straight through there, and actually it coincides with that. So this is a, an axial space, and in fact, this element which establishes the axis has two side windows. You see the axis goes out to this projecting balcony also, and so you have a narrow bay, a wide bay, a narrow bay, which is also within the kind of classical tradition. At the same time, the, the stair rising from this uh, space, um, I mean, the, the movement of the space is like that, so it's not exactly spiraling, but it, it, it comes up to this raised level, this library looking down into the space. And then you, you have to recognize that the, that kind of organic form has something to do with the arts and crafts tradition, and the, this, ra this, this library raised above the living volume is, um, is, is a bit like a kind of minstrel's gallery in an arts and crafts house. So there's something taken from the arts and crafts, but it is you know, transformed well, well, with great genius and synthesized to, to, to make a kind of new synthesis with certain elements that come from the classical. So, you see it very clearly here, I think, that these, um, um, yeah, that these, these um, elements, you know, are, uh, yeah, this, uh, you can see the, the way the axis works on that side, and uh, here the axis at the other end with the stair rising up. As opposed to this, the, the horizontality of this space and the very different attitude towards the windows, which sort of open up in a spiraling fashion out of this space. And then, you know, even the floor is treated as a kind of abstract, uh, uh, yes, uh, series of spiraling elements. And um, whereas this one, you know, we're, we're in the dining space looking into the living. And uh, OK, so. Sorry. Yeah, and then, uh, well, this shows, you know, very much the difference between the so-called fenêtre en longueur, the long window, which is partly sliding, partly casement windows, versus this corner, this large corner with the window in the living space of the Rietveld Schroeder house, or, well, these are details of the house, the upper terrace in in the Maison Cook and the service space behind. I mean, even that space behind is, um, well, what, what is interesting is that finally what you get out of it, this uh, Maison Cook has implicit bourgeois values when, and the other house is very bohemian in its kind of uh, concept of everyday life. I mean, I'm saying this because this is a kind of servant's entrance, you see, here. And it's kind of pathetic in a way because it's an attempt to create, in a very small house, this hierarchy between servant entrance and, um, and the, the main public entrance so that, uh, well, no, where is it? I don't know, I've lost it. Um, let me go back. Yeah. It, uh, yes, here you see the servant entrance is there. They still have to enter by this path, but it's, it, you know, it's, a, it's an attempt to try to separate out the servant's entrance from the entrance of the family, although they, hope they kind of they, they inevitably collide with each other in any case, so it's a bit pathetic. But it, it, what I'm arguing is that 
there's a value built into the way in which it's designed. It's very much a bourgeois value, you know, and as opposed to a bohemian value. So, um, I mean, implying that kind of way of life, um, right? So this is the p that that section where one compares this business of expression, suppression of structure. I mean the 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 structure in this case, you know, is well. Of course, the column is expressed, you know, and the the cross walls are in place. Here, you know, this is more or less the structure, which is all framed. You can see it's all in these are working drawings entirely frame construction rendered over. And in this case, you have concrete block construction rendered over. I mean, this is not the Maison Cook, it's the Villa Garde. It, he, he never published these photographs, except in the Architecture de Vivant, but in his oeuvre complete, they're, they're suppressed, i.e. The, the crudeness of the reinforced concrete frame with concrete block before it gets rendered over. I mean, I'm, I show the concrete block so that this shows then, you know, the, the so-called five points of the new architecture, which is this roof garden, this piloti, the uh, free facade cantilevered in front of the column system, and the free plan that is, you know, the load-bearing supports are not uh, contingent with the subdivision of the space. These are the, are the five points, of, and the long window, the typical mechanical element of the house. And um, yeah, brings me to this part of the uh, comparison. Yes, because what then in this case becomes particularly fascinating is the different use of color so that, and it's probably quite sh for sure that Le Corbusier was influenced by neoplastic. This is a, a um, pinwheeling composition by uh, Cor van Eastern and Thier van Dersberg in the exhibition of 1923. And this work probably was, in terms of color, influenced by it, but quite different colors. Burnt, uh, umber, cerulean red, uh, pale yellow, green, etc., black, you know, not the neoplastic primary colors. And then we come to this, uh, you know, I think it is of relevance, this extraordinary map of the that's published in 25, which is of his Voyage d'Orient of 1912 in Europe, where he points out in different European capitals, you have I for industry, F for folklore, and C for culture, which I've always thought that he really means by culture, the classic. And that, you know, like the Ruhr Gebiet is entirely I, for example. Paris is this mixture of C and, and some I. Um, Istanbul is almost entirely F, folkloric, etc., across the map of Europe. And the difference between the value differences between these two works, which relate in this particular case, that's why I always use it as the same point of departure, to certain ideological differences that are, that are evident in abstract painting. So in uh, Mondrian, you know, it's entirely a, a uh, composition again, involving gray, yellow, red, uh, blue, and black, and uh, will extend to furniture, you know, as a kind of total work of art in the case of the Rietveld uh, red, red and blue chair of 1917, also used in the Rietveld Schroeder house, as opposed to this, you know, the Thonne furniture as found objects uh, used in the Maison Cook, and in other works of his. And then this uh, famous 1920 piece, uh, this, uh, um, you know, uh, composition uh, of, of, you know, combining, you know, bottles, kind of ambiguous book, could be of uh, architectural molding, clay pipes, bottles, and uh, uh, guitar and so on. And the way in which, this is a Bernard Hosley drawing, the layered space of the gar Villa Garche and the, layer, the illusory layered space of the painting can be compared. And what I think one can take out of it is that the, 
that this uh, post-cubism, April cubism painting, this um, of 1920 by by uh, Genere, is is uh, is not only uh, um, an abstract uh, competition uh, composition, but is iconographically a representation of a uh, found, not designed products of an industrial civilization. These, you know, this as in the Thonet chair or in American office equipment, all of which is shown in this uh, book of, um, of 1925, bearing the title Decorative Art Today. So with that as a point of departure, I will show you two other uh, buildings, uh, two other comparisons. And I, and I should perhaps say that th the book is organized into 14 comparisons. They pass from uh, exhibition pavilions and houses to uh, low rise density housing, uh, medium rise housing, to um, um, congress buildings, concert halls, uh, museums, um, um, and office buildings, and, and stadia. And at different times we've also done churches and libraries and so on. But this, the 14 comparisons in the book at the moment uh, consist of those and so this is um, a comparison of two houses. This is back a comparison of the Tugendhat, Tugendhat house of uh, Mies in uh, Brno. Yeah. Uh, uh, that is actually dated uh, 1930, but actually I think it was finished, of, completely finished like in 32 or something like that. And this is uh, the Villa Marea in Normaku in Finland, uh, Alto, of course. So the, it's a comparison between these two works. Um, both built for tycoon, you know, well, built for very rich people, uh, or like industrialists in both cases. Uh, in, in the case of Berno for Fritz and Greta Tuchenhardt, who were textile um, magnets. And, and in, in this case, of course, for um, Maria Gulliksen, who was the heir to the Alstrom uh, pulp mill and um, um, paper uh, um, company. And, and um, so, it, I mean, her name, well, the, the, in fact, the, the manager, of course, managing director of the company, marries the boss's daughter. So it, she became Maria Gulliksen. Harry Gulliksen was her husband. And, um, and uh, but the, the villa is, is named after her, Villa Maria. It's finished in 39. I mean, the, or even when you look at these establishing shots, there are interesting things about the coding of the house in that the private bedrooms are in all rendered white, you know. This is actually the master bedrooms, but also the children's bedrooms are here, and they're all rendered white. And the public space, you know, is, is finished in wood with a uh, black... Uh, granite used on the lower part, just underneath this wood. They're finished in wooden louvers and wooden battens. The entrance to the building is here. In this case, the, the steel frame construction blocks again, uh, and the building is rendered white throughout. And there's no discrimination between the, um, the, um, the, the sleeping quarters, or the more private quarters, and the more public quarters, whereas in the in the in the in the Villa Maria there is, and and then the the two buildings have very different site because here it's a kind of uh, expensive suburb overlooking the Spielberg Castle. This is a sort of panorama overlooking Brunn. This is a this is a house, and this is the travertine forecourt and this uh, obscure glass uh, uh, entrance hall at the upper level. Uh, steel frame uh, column support and this kind of opening here which looks out over the city. And here, the, this is in a kind of estate, a wooded estate, the third of a series of houses built for three different generations, surrounded by forest, you know, as a, as a clearing within the forest. And they are both asymmetrical works, in fact. Uh, the, the, the type is asymmetrical. And the, um, 
Right. And, and the, the main um, living floor uh, in, in, the, in the Villa Maria is that grade with the, with the bedrooms above. In this building, uh, going down the slope, the bedrooms are above and the living is below. In this case, of course, the living is below and the bedrooms are above. And, uh, well, you see how this shows very clearly, you know, when it's sort of brought down into this uh, um, very large and, and un, yes, relatively unstructured space. I mean, the, there's a, it is, of course, articulated by freestanding columns and blade walls. But, but furniture plays an enormously important role in, in kind of identifying what these spaces are. And this is a kind of library study music room. This is the sort of main conversation area. This is the winter garden. This is the dining space, you know, with uh, eight chairs around, uh, around the circular table. And this is the way out to the terrace and the garden. And here, you know, these, this is all designated private. It's basically servant and servery area. This is the staircase coming down from uh, above, as opposed to this, where you enter straight here into the space. And you divide, already you're broken up. I mean, the, the public area is broken up into different uh, ac action settings, in a way. This is a sort of sunroom. This is a private study. This is a private little sort of uh, winter garden, main fireplace in the corner, the main staircase. This is the dining volume. And here, then, are the, this is a kind of living kitchen and various servant rooms and some service facilities. And here you enter at this upper level and go down either this stair or this stair through a double door underneath a canopy so that the, the mode of entry is different, the mode of circulation is different, and the organization of the space is different. And perhaps one of the most interesting things vis-a-vis -vis built in value would be if we compare, for example, this dining space you know, veneered in rosewood, semicircular, around a circular table. Eight uh, rather monumental chairs. And of course, the furniture in both cases plays rather key role. But in this case, there is a long dining table uh, seating more people with a fireplace at the end and actually a barbecue fireplace on the other side. And, you know, the, the implication is that, you know, one, one dining space is much more... Yes, I think much more op much more uh, generous, open than the other, less idealized, less elitist. Whereas I think this space has a more elitist character. You know, also the, you know, coming partly off the, the rosewood veneer. You know, and also of course off the furniture itself. And uh, well, okay, let, and if we go to this. This is the upper level of the Tugendhat, and this is the, the main living volume, looking back at this winter garden, and then beyond the winter garden to the natural landscape. And uh, here you see that the, the bedroom levels are, are sort of self-contained. There is no spatial movement here. There's only a certain spatiality in the way in which you enter. Uh, you can see how you go from this public into this public level, um, which is the lower level. And then this use of wood, like uh, in the case of the studio of um, Maria Gulikson, you know, this, in fact, this whole studio of hers is treated like a kind of, uh, like a head, really, Sort of, it's a prow of the building, and and I mean being, um, you know, here wood ha wood is the honorific material, you know, and uh, you can see this is the upper level, you know, where the this is the prow of the building, this is the two master bedrooms, his and hers. There's a kind of this whole space is semi-public in as much as it's not really just a corridor; it's also a kind of family space with a chimney in the corner here. And these are, of course, uh, secondary bedrooms. And uh, 
Well, there's different circulation movements that lead you down to the lower level and also into the um, bedrooms. And um, which brings us to this, to this um, canopy and also to the staircase, which is also a staircase taken from the English arts and crafts movement, which I will try to show. And uh, um, so in the, in the bottom, on the, on the right, your right, the bottom level one's looking out over the um, lawn and the plunge pool to the sauna beyond. And, um, yeah. And, and, and then uh, uh, in the top right, this staircase with these, uh, these stairs supported by these poles, which are the screen of poles, which are, are slightly different diameter and irregular uh, rhythm. And, um, and in fact, are also in the end taken from the arts and crafts, as you will see here, so that, yeah. Well, this is a comparison of the structure. Um, the fact that the structure is on, is gridded in both cases, uh, partly on square grids, and um, and partly load bearing and partly not. But the 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 fascinating thing is, um, well, let's say if one takes this Tugendhat chair, you know, it, related to the Barcelona chair de de designed for twenty nine, this is slightly less formal, you know, by virtue of the way in which it is cantilevered and so on, on this flat bar steel. Or for the other surprising detail is, this is getting into details here, that um, this is actually this Paul Henningsen lamp, so-called pH lamp, which he uses in the main living space, as opposed to this, which is more sort of uh, objective, Formal. This is much more celebratory and organic, these kind of shifts in detail. Or this, which is Schinkel's Peacock uh, uh, House project, which, you know, there is the, the Italianate <coughs> aspect of, the, of Mises' language at this moment is very evident in, in, you know, in the way in which it borrows from Schinkel's Italianate works. And this, of course, is the famous column, which, in which you know, there seems to be a metaphor for a classic column, in as much as the highlights of the column uh, could be associated with flutes. Of course, the combination of this chromium steel cladding to the column and the onyx behind gives a particular character. And Mies, unlike Hannes Meyer, going back now to that figure is someone who's preoccupied with the idea of being able to transform technology into something transcendental, basically, something spiritual. It's, it's an aim that he had then in, uh, in 1930, and it's an aim that he would also in the States uh, continue. I mean, what, what is in interesting is, is the, the care he takes about sun control, you know. Of course, it, you know, you, lo you look at a structure which is just as much suppressed as it is expressed. I mean, there is, of course, these, these windows that drop down into the basement of the, of the building. Uh, and then if you, in terms of values, like this, for example, is actually Galen Kalela's studio in Ruzave, Ru Ruzavesi in Finland, where there is this white plastered uh, a kind of stove block of heat in this wooden, uh, rather organically organized wooden studio. And this is a detail of the fireplace in the Villa Maria, and I think, you know, it, I think it makes a rather obvious reference to that. Or this, of course, is actually Voise's house in Corley Wood um, of 1899, and you see this, this kind of screen to the staircase probably can be taken as a source of, of the, the staircase inside the Villa Maria. So that this reference to 
in the Villa Maria to arts and crafts culture is also present in this um, staircase, staircase on the right, is also um, combined with um, tubular steel columns that are lacquered black and then bound in different ways or um, coupled into threes or into twos or used singly. <coughs> and, and you know, g giving a certain Japanese referential uh, at the level of detail. I mean, the black lacquer, of course, and the binding operation. And here, you know, the, well, of course, the Finnish national tradition, the sauna, the, the, the grass-covered roof of the sauna, and this detail of the gate leading out to the forest, all of these, uh, <coughs> you know, establish the, the value of the, of the house. I was going to, yes, this is the last two comparisons. I was going to say something about um, All right, let me go on to. So this is actually the Augusta House of Pat Cow Architects, 1996 in the year 2000. And this is, of course, Rick Joy's two-back house, um, not so far from here. They're both retirement homes, and they, uh, they both establish a quite different uh, uh, relationship to the context because the Augusta house is in the middle of a clearing, Douglas fir. It, it, it sort of reads on the site as a kind of dam across the open space between, uh, lined on, on two sides by, um, by this, the tree line of this, um, which is not reading very clearly in this drawing. This is the, this is the tree line here. You know, and the tree line there, and this is sort of like a uh, you're dividing the site into these two areas. Small garage here, where you walk to the house in this fashion, or you can walk directly to the main entrance there. And this is the the sort of grid or fence-like form of the house across the meadow. In this case. You know, we have a house that is, you know, inserted, inscribed into the desert, let into the desert. In fact, there's a seven-foot drop uh, down into the, uh, to the to the main living level. In fact, uh, from from the point of the drive-in, and uh, so that uh, yes, I think yeah here, you know, this is the. The drive-in is here, and then the car goes around to this garage at the back of this workshop guest block. And you descend by these steps into this courtyard, this being the main living and uh, office space, and the swimming pool, and the views out to the, um, to the mountains, to the Tumakakori peaks. Seem to have a, someone's trying to tell me something. <laughs> time to sh time to stop, I think. And so you know, you then then these hmm. yes, these two um, houses get developed in this uh, different way. You know that this house this house developed like a kind of fence operation. It's very nice. Stop. Uh, uh, was upset about something. Uh, uh, so uh, again, it's it, the 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 bu the buildings are analysed for the you know the way in which the space is organised, the kind of movement of the people through the space. This is living dining, of course. This grey is the kitchen. There is a way of entering. There's a kind of kitchen garden here, which is fenced in. There's a way of entering via this mudroom into the kitchen. You can see through this fence to the terrace and beyond. It overlooks the Gulf Islands. And and uh, the Harrow Strait, in fact, and here, you know, it, well, you see the way you enter into the space and go back to the sleeping and to the offices, and uh, 
and forward to the terrace, the sort of covered porch and the terrace of the swimming pool. And, and well, it gives you the, these, it shows this extraordinary space where the water is brought to the top of these steel tanks. And, um, well, you know, it, it, um, the values of these two houses are quite different. What they are associated with is quite different. I mean, uh, somewhere, it's about to start again. Um, somewhere, uh, yes. Rick um, makes this uh, comment about uh, the two-back house, which I like on uh, where he says, um, see, it's really trying very hard to keep his mouth shut, but he's still trying to speak. Uh, he says, the gravel path to the house crunches beneath your feet. Through a, a garden of barrel cactuses that appear to be standing guard, one descends into a courtyard by way of a stair wedged between two retaining walls from here, an oasis unfolds. Cool, dark, shaded areas. The sound of water trickling, hummingbirds, the smell of sage, flowers, re reflections. I mean, what is, of course, very, very uh, characteristic of his work is this kind of sensuous reading of architecture which goes beyond the visual to the tactile value uh, to the phenomenological experience of the space. But what I think is quite apart from that aspect, um, maybe I need this side here. And this side, what do I have here? Yes, this. I, I find it amazing, you know, in, in the way in which this house has been furnished is, uh, and I think the architect played a big role in this, you know, is, is extremely urbane, uh, you know, a, sense, a very strong sense of urbanity inside this building in, in front of the desert. And in this case, uh, it's much more vernacular-like, you know, it does not have the same urban feel to it, neither at the level of furniture, nor at the level of the way the interior of the, of the space is, is articulated and detailed. And, uh, So one, of course, you can associate the one, I think, with pioneering, with stockades, you know, with kind of protected farm buildings. It sort of makes an a, a overt rest, uh, reference to the American pioneering past. And uh, the other one is more uh, concerned with the view from the living space uh, and, and through the the calm and, and security of the interior. And then if you, if you try to trace it, you can see how the, the Augusta House, I think, has a lot more to do with Frank Lloyd Wright and the tradition of Wright. This is Wright's Ocotillo Camp in the desert. And, and also, the, this is actually the drafting room in uh, Tellier and West. And uh, so that uh, the the traditions to which they are alluding are quite different. And um, this, in fact, shows on this plate, you know, this is um, Predox La Luce in Adobe, you know. I'm not, and this is, of course, Barragan's uh, Las Arbolitas, 1961. Um, I think that both of these works can be seen as as influences or as references, you know, to the uh, two-back house, whereas this is a Strawberry Vale school and can be seen, you know, in relation to the work of Wright. And, and to the kind of values that Wright, Wright's uh, work uh, presupposes. Okay, this is the, the and, and this is where it ends. I want to just sum up with something that, um, So, for example, of the um, well, this is actually a, a greater Togenhardt writing about the interior of the living room of the Togenhardt house. 
The principal sitting area may serve as an example for the range of color in front of the uh, tawny golden onyx wall. A rug of natural wool stood a group of Barcelona and Tuganart chairs, a Tuganart coffee table and a bench table. The cushions of the Barcelona chairs were covered with emerald green cowhide. Those of the Tuganart chairs in a silver gray fabric. Ruby red velvet had been chosen for the cushion of a reclining chair placed against the long glass wall, which could be closed by curtains of silver gray Shantan silk in order to emphasize the floor as a plane parallel and equal to the ceiling. This floor was surfaced in its entirety in white linoleum. I mean, this description of the interior also implies a certain kind of uh, value, I think, you know, a, a certain way of life, in fact. That, that is for sure, I think. And, um, or this is, this is with regard to the, um, the Villa Maria. The irregular spacing and binding of the columns, like the rhythmic syncopation of the timber poles enclosing the main stair, evoke the irregular spacing of trees in the surrounding forest. These rustic allusions are complemented by the turf roof of the sauna that extends onto the canopy linking it to the house. The hybrid nature of this last is evident in the mixed superstructure of exposed reinforced concrete frame and the rattan bound timber pillars, pillars which echo the rustic bindings of the freestanding columns within. A similar spirit informs other elements, such as the undressed timber balustrade of the first floor, stripped of its bark, the thick rubble stone that surrounds the garden, and the wicker gate leading into the forest. This last is secured by a wooden latch of Swiss provenance that was introduced into the work by Alto's assistant, Swiss assistant Bernoulli. While modern technology plays a salient role in both these houses, the Villa Maria self-consciously oscillates between tradition and innovation by continually referring to agrarian building, while at the same time exploiting the specifically modern capacity of steel and rifles concrete construction. While both houses derive their respective asymmetry in the first instance from Schinkel and in the second from the Anglo-Saxon arts and crafts tradition, they owe much of their intrinsic character to the canonical furniture pieces of their respective architects. The Juggernaut pieces, Mises MR chairs, etc., and the Villa Maria Altos designs, such as the Paimio chair, and so on. And of the, um, of the comparison which I've just made between um, the uh, Augusta House and the Tubac House. Both houses are equally influenced by the different landscapes and climates and native building cultures of the American continent. The four space, a four space accompanies each building which grounds the respective structures within their sites. This space is comprised of an earthwork in one instance and by a louvered stockade in the other, where the living room portico deck swimming pool of the Tyler House out, looks out over the desert. The somewhat introspective external domain of the Augusta House in the enclosed living room terrace opens to a distant prospect of the sea. The Tyler House asserts a luminous urbanity as opposed to the darker interior of the Augusta House where a monopitched timber roof absorbs within it, the light of the Pacific. The common monopitch form has a different impact in each instance, sloping down as an inclined if reflective plane to a horizontal window in the one, and rising up as imposed timber purlings to a skylight in the other, where the one asserts an artificial hedonistic domain within a hostile desert, the other is a layered permeable structure spanning across a clearing in the midst of a forest landscape. I mean, these, this is what you know, these analyses try to get at in terms of the explicit or implicit values that I believe uh, can, be, 
can be consciously, um, also unconsciously, also, but can be consciously conceived as, as part of the architectural form, as indeed an intention, you know. And um, and I suppose the aim is to try to make that coherent, you know, to to make it. Uh, to reveal it, really. The aim of this analysis is to try to reveal, reveal just that. You know, given the, brings me back to the beginning, given to the, multiplici the multiplicity of, of expression, the multi multiplicity of language games, what kind of, uh, of uh, coherence or, or, or value can we find in built fabric uh, as an intention? That's the whole game. Thank you. So I want to thank uh, Professor Frampton for joining us and thank you as well. Uh, many of my younger colleagues may not have a full appreciation for, for Frampt Professor Frampton's role in shaping the dialogue about architecture, um, certainly in our culture and across the ocean. For 50 or 60 years, Professor Frampton has argued for a particular, intelligent, sensible architecture culture that's been grounded in, in practice and for some part of that period, he was a bit of a lone voice. I think it's harder for us in Arizona, studying <coughs> great architects like Rick Joy, where Professor Frampton's values have taken root and grown. It's a little harder for us to appreciate that. But I assure you that his impact has been sizable. Um, there are thousands of people like myself and my generation who toast reading of Frampton's work, appreciating what it was that he had to teach us about architecture. It's just a huge honor to have him at our school. Thank you for that. Oh, thanks. thanks. Tremendous work. Oh, and thanks. Long All right. Thank you. Tradition. Thanks. Thanks.